Okay. Hello. Right. Today's talk will be Legacy of Descent with Einstein's Relativity. Yeah. There is a Legacy of Descent with Einstein's Relativity because it does not make sense. Even if you ex accept the basis of it, it still does not make sense. First of all, go to this link of uh, Planck and then a quote by him. This is uh, Max Planck Wikipedia. <coughs> uh, lived from 1858 to 1947. Uh, German theoretical physicist who is supposed to have originated the quantum theory, but I reckon it goes back further than that. And he won the Nobel Prize in Physics for 1918. Made many contributions to theoretical physics. Uh, we'll get down, you should be saying something about Einstein. Uh, Max Planck's uh, quantum theory revolutionized human understanding of atomic and subatomic processes just as Albert Einstein's theory of relativity revitalized the understanding of space and time. Uh, if you look into the history of it, uh, Max Planck seems to be the main person who got Einstein out of obscurity. Uh, Einstein wrote his papers which he became famous for in 1905 and Max Planck was the one who allowed them to be published. And I think they became sort of friends so they were in it together. So what's this? There's a quote by him, if I enlarge it. A new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up uh, that is familiar with it. So, let's see if I move over a bit more. Yeah, I might show about that pipe. Down. Now, Planck is wrong if he thinks Einstein will eventually be accepted. There is now an ongoing distinct dissent legacy. People have dissented against Einstein and it's been going on and on through the generations. If we go to uh, the Herbert Dingle, look at him first. This is Herbert Dingle. Herbert Dingle lived 1890 to 1978. English physicist and natural philosopher and was the president of the Royal Astronomical Society from 1951 to 1953. He is best known for his opposition to Einstein's special theory of relativity and the protracted controversy that this provoked. So, he was protesting against Einstein's relativity. If you read the history, he initially started that he believed in it, and then eventually he went opposed it. And the problem is in relativity, you find there's contradictions in it. In the sense that some people will say one thing about special relativity, and other people will say a different thing. And so when he found that out, I think he decided relativity must be wrong if it leads people to say contradictory things. So he sadly passed away now, but his legacy of descent still carries on and it's picked up by his friend who's here, a Professor Ian McClausland, who's now 85. The ongoing consent, descent with Einstein. Uh, he was, he was for many years a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering uh, so forth so forth 
at the University of Toronto and is now Professor um, Emeritus, uh, so he's retired. Da -da -da, of course. Uh, then in recent years he has taken in a long debate on the self-consistency of special relativity with Professor Good. Uh, Professor Good is a was a retired statistics professor uh, and, and the debate is published on the pages of physics essays uh, yep so so ongoing ongoing there so he's taken it up and it's still ongoing if we go to another site this one here uh, twin paradox challenge Twin Paradox Challenge uh, It's an open letter to the physics community about the Twin Paradox and basically the issue is that, that the, they don't come up with one single explanation for the Twin Paradox they just talk lots of different ideas and it's not not coherent it's, it just does not make sense so we've got this Twin Paradox idea of uh, usually represented as a per twins one twin stays on earth and another twin goes off in a spaceship and then he comes back to earth and the aging is different between them and so so explanation for that this is just ambiguous because different people say different things as to the explanation of that so that's where we are so it's an ongoing dissent with Einstein so if Max Planck thinks he's uh, th that he has uh, all he has to do is wait for people to die this is Max Planck or if he thinks he has to do that then he's all opponents to Einstein's relativity we just keep going on so Next, I refer you to uh, McClawton's paper and a talk he's going to give. So, uh, here we go. The paper. There. This is the paper, and it's uh, reviewing the riddle of relativity, and this is what he'll be dealing with in his talk. And he starts off I describe my collaboration with Professor Herbert Dingle. <clears throat> in his campaign against Einstein's special theory of relativity and my subsequent attempts to draw attention to the inadequate response by scientists to his criticism. So Professor Dingle criticised uh, special relativity and the mainstream physicists never uh, properly responded to that criticism. Our active collaboration started with the publication of Dingle's book Science at the Crossroads in 1972 and continued unto his death in 1978. This paper celebrates the 40th anniversary of that book and points out that the dogmatic adherence of scientists to the special theory has continued to make it difficult for honest and informed criticism to be heard. Two arguments against the special theory are presented, both of which a very distinguished mathematician tried to refute but failed go down. This paper describes some of my activities over a 40 year period of critical study of Einstein's special theory of relativity which started with my collaboration with Herbert Dingle, a very eminent critic of the spe special theory. These activities are reflected more fully in my book, A Scientific Adventure Reflections on the Medical Relativity. And so you can read the rest of it. And one of the problems highlights some of the things. So the paradox in comes in. A paradox arises when two apparently sound but contradictory conclusions, X and Y, result from the same premises, P. 
it can be resolved only by one disproving x, two disproving y, or three finding a contradiction inherent in p. All additional proofs of x or y do nothing without a disproof of y or x. And so this is one of the problems with uh, relativity. It's giving people, uh, leads people to say different things. So it's contradictory in that sense. And he goes on. This is his debate, Professor Good. Professor Good was trying to defend relativity. And the problem is that people who talk about relativity will say one thing one moment and then change their mind and think they, and then they say something else. And so he deals with all of it here. His conclusion in the 40 year period since the publication of Science at the Crossroads, that's by, <coughs> that's by Dink, Professor Dingle, and the scientific community has celebrated with great pomp and ceremony the centenary of Einstein's birth in 1979 and the centenary of his uh, miraculous year in 2005. His miraculous year would be uh, when he wrote his papers on special relativity, which is 1905. So that would be 100 years an anniversary celebrating that. Unfortunately, however, the scientific community has shown no inclination to include a critical reassessment of his theory in any such celebrations. As a result, the deification of Einstein has become more ardent than ever, and critics of the special theory continue to be dis dismissed as crack crackpox. Uh, scientists continue to ignore the self-evident contradictions in the arguments that were used by Herman Dingle's critics to answer his criticisms. So Herbert Dingle criticised special relativity and people who criticised Herbert Dingle in trying to defend special relativity contradicted themselves uh, and and that that's still ongoing. People who you profess a belief in special relativity still contradict themselves. And editors of mainstream journals refuse even to continue, consider papers critical of Einstein's work. In their avoidance of criticism of relativity, scientists are weakening science instead of strengthening it. For criticism ought to be a vital part of science. So, so the conclusions is uh, they don't like they don't like people criticising Einstein anymore, and they're trying to block it in the science papers, and that's really. Uh, not being open enough to show that there are, although there are people who believe in Einstein's relativity there is still an opposition to it it should be open to show that people are still disagreeing with it and it's an ongoing legacy of people disagreeing with uh, Einstein's relativity so if we go back to that's Planck, Max Planck i go back to his quote here we go. So, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that's familiar with it. So, if you're considering Einstein having his opponents, um, yes, they die, and a new generation of his opponents come along, but then really what the mainstream is trying to do is block those opponents from. Uh, getting published in the science journals and that's how bad they are so it's not they're not died they're just trying to ignore them and so when when it comes to the stage of scientific truth from our point of view it is that Einstein is wrong that's our scientific truth and so truth is supposed to go through uh, three stages stage one is you ignore it stage two you ridicule it and stage three you accept it and so we're at stage one now at the moment where the mainstream is trying to pretend that, that there is no opposition to Einstein's relativity in the mainstream journals as much as it can. So that's the terrible situation we're in. They're not open to criticism. 
the criticism is on such issues as the twin paradox they contradict themselves one expert in uh, relativity will try to give one answer to the twin paradox and another person who says an expert will say something completely different there is no consistent single solution to the twin paradox coming out from the uh, mainstream mm -hmm. so that's the paper I'll get to the talk here we go this is the talk <coughs> this is a talk by Ian McClawson Let's go. speaker, Dr. Ian Rapazzo, and I know he's been active with the NPA many years ago, but hasn't actually come here to join us for a long time. It's a great... If I make, make the sound a bit more... Oh, it's quite high. Hmm. It's a pleasure to have you here. He just wrote a new book in the last year, which is in the back. I hope you pick up a copy. Dr. McCausland worked personally with uh, Herbert Dingle, and if any of you don't know who Herbert Dingle is, you better find out, because he was one of the people who actually was uh, wrote books on relativity in as early as the 1930s, am I right? I'm not sure. Real early, and he was the author world's authority on Einsteinian relativity at an early, early date. And some so, Herbert Dingle <coughs> was uh, authority on Einstein's relativity in his in its early in its early days of that theory, and then eventually he turned against it. And this is what I pointed out here: an opponent of Einstein's relativity. Um, Einsteinian relativity at an early early date, and sometime later came to challenge uh, Einstein's ideas, and um, wrote numerous papers on it, and, and got ostracized for his efforts. He did write a book called Science in the Crossroads in 1972, and it was about that time that you came in contact with him, I think, and uh, so he kept up a correspondence and has been uh, writing about issues of relativity for decades, so I'd like you to please welcome Dr. Ian McCausland. Thank you very much, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. On, uh, <clears throat> uh, as Greg uh, indicated, this is essentially about my uh, collaboration with Professor Herbert Dingle. Uh, this is Professor Dingle. Uh, he was a very eminent British scientist. I think you can judge his eminence by the fact that this picture comes from the archives of the British um, uh, National Portrait Gallery in London. Uh, this is a book, Science at the Crossroads and it was published in 1972, so I'm celebrating the 40th anniversary of that, and the 40th anniversary of essentially my collaboration with him. Uh, he was essentially the first critic of the orthodox uh, result of the top paradox, or the twin paradox. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The twin paradox says that a, uh, an astronaut going away into space and coming back years later would be younger than his twin brother who had stayed at home. Uh, <clears throat> he then, uh, he, he disagreed with that result. He said that they should age equally. And then later he came to the conclusion that uh, both results arrived from the special theory and that therefore the special theory contained a contradiction. In my book, I, uh, A Scientific Adventure, I described uh, <clears throat> how he uh, had um, written about this. And I, I also came to share his view that the special theory contained a contradiction. And my there you go. So <clears throat> Dingle dis concluded that special relativity was contradictory because it led to two different conclusions. And eventually his friend here, uh, Professor Clausen, has, has reached the same conclusion that special relativity is contradictory. It leads to two different conclusions and it does it quite often. When you try to study it you, you end up with coming to different conclusions. Prediction um, my book is uh, uh, my, my book deals with that. Uh, 
I should perhaps explain this peculiar picture on the cover. Uh, this is a uh, left-hand side is a print by Moritz Escher, a Dutch uh, artist, and it's a very strange uh, space. One of the strangest things is, whoops, sorry, uh, the, uh, the little, these two little men here are uh, walking from left to right along the stage staircase, but one is walking upstairs and one is walking downstairs. Uh, that's that's relativity for you. If you wish to look in uh, YouTube under the heading of Escher Relativity, you can find an animated version of this in which the little men walk about. Okay, so uh, the central question in my book is, is there or is there not an internal inconsistency in Einstein's theory as described in his original paper? The answer that I emphasize as described in his original paper on the subject, because the answer is then contained in this book, which is a collection of papers on relativity, on, in English translation, of course. So, the problem, one of the problems is the or original presentation of Einstein's special theory of relativity was in his miracle year of 1905. So, is there contradictions? and inconsistency in what he's writing in 1905? My answer would be yes there is. But since 1905 uh, there has been work by Einstein and others on special relativity and so it is unclear how much it is supposed to be updated since that time. It's total ambiguous as to what is supposed to be the theory. Are we supposed to take it as from 1905 or are we supposed to take some sort of amendment since 1905? And so that is another big problem, the revisions that have happened to Einstein's relativity. So under some revision you could say, well, you could take a different interpretation again as to what Einstein's relativity is saying. So under all these different revisions, it's more, more ambiguity. But going straight back to... Einstein's original paper in 1905, from my point of view and other people, that paper does not make sense. Um, in English translation, of course. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I, I go rather beyond Dingle in this because Dingle argued that, that experimental support for the theory depended on circular arguments. I say experimental support for the theory is completely irrelevant. Uh, if you think that's extreme, suppose just some... So, having Dingle saying it is uh, circular arguments for special activity and circular arguments is really a logical fallacy to do that. And if you go on to the actual experiments, uh, this McClawson is saying the experiments don't really matter anymore. Because I think, in a sense, if a theory is contradictory, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, experiments are just not going to say, give anything useful when you try to test such a theory. It just doesn't make, makes, makes experiments completely worthless, a theory which is inconsistent. So we get on to that. Their arguments. I say experimental support for the theory is completely irrelevant. Uh, if you think that's extreme, suppose a scientist broke out the theory today and showed it to a colleague, and the colleague said, uh, read it over and said, there is a logical contradiction on page six. Uh, suppose the scientist said, well, only even looking at page six, I will prove to you by experiment that there is no logical contradiction. Well, I think his colleague would laugh at him. Uh, yeah, because that such a claim would be nonsense. If you've got a theory that is logically contradictory, and then you're going to kind of make a silly claim that you can actually test that by experiment, then you're just being stupid. How can you prove or disprove a logical contradiction by experiment? If you've got a theory that is contradictory, you don't even want to test it. 
his colleagues would laugh at him. Uh, I cannot exactly show that there's a logical contradiction on page six, but uh, here's uh, something that shows somewhat of a uh, problem in the theory. Uh, this is one paragraph taken from this translation, and uh, I split it into two parts, because that's the way I did it in some of the papers that I wrote. And the underlying part on the left-hand side is, one, is essentially the statement of the clock paradox, the orthodox result. If, if we have two clocks, one of them goes around in a circle relative to the other, then it is the one that moved is slow relative to the one that stayed behind. <laughs> I think almost every relativist would defend this with the utmost tenacity. But when you look at the right-hand statement, a bound clock at the equator must go more slowly than a precisely similar clock at one of the poles under otherwise identical conditions. They're not nearly so sure of the ground. Excuse me. footnote says not a pendulum clock, but a, uh, this is physically a system to which the Earth belongs. That uh, shows that he's talking about a real result and not just a matter of observation. Now, Dingle asked the question about that particular result. He said, applied to this example, what entitled Einstein to conclude from his theory that the equatorial and not the polar clock work more slowly? Here's one answer. There are three answers from Dingle, uh, reviews of Dingle's book. He says the relative motion is not... I think it pointed out that um, Dingle asked this question and then you got three different answers from people trying to support Einstein's relativity. So first of all, you've got this person trying to support Einstein's relativity by giving this answer. Dingle, uh, re reviews of Dingle's book. He says the relative motion is non-uniform, therefore he says Einstein was wrong. Although he doesn't, commit, he doesn't admit defeat, he says the prediction is not invalid because he was anticipating his later theory. I hold the view that any answer to Dingle's question that's a valid answer must have the property that it would have been a valid answer if the question had been asked right after the paper was published. So if you imagine somebody being asked, or if you imagine Einstein being asked right after the paper was published, what, how, how, did you, how do you uh, justify this statement? Supposing he'd said, well, I'm not quite sure, but I'm working on a new theory, and so come back and ask me the question in 10 years' time, and I'll give you your answer. This is Whitrow's answer. Uh, also, adding on to point for this, that uh, this person who believed in Einstein's relativity uh, was saying that uh, on his view of it, Einstein answered the question incorrectly, and he still believed in Einstein's relativity. Just he's got his belief that <clears throat> Einstein made a mistake working from his theories. So that's the first point of view. So we're now getting on to a second point of view by a person who believes in Einstein's relativity. This is Whitrow's answer. Uh, I don't want to spend time in dealing with it because there's a lot that could be said about it, but the, one, the main point I want to make is that... He... I'll just read it out. I can read it out. This is Whitrow who believes in Einstein's relativity, and this is his answer to the question. For a support of relativity, the essential difference between the two clocks is, the, is that relative to the centre of the Earth, which for the purpose concerned can be regarded as the origin of an inertial frame, the clock at the equator describes a circle and so cannot be associated with an inertial frame, whereas the polar clock is at rest and can be associated with an inertial frame for a period of time during which the curvature of the Earth's orbit can be neglected. So the previous person, the first person, 
is thinking Einstein's made a mistake and this person is coming up with a complicated explanation as to which frames are in inertial frame and it's all very confusing here what what frames an inertial frame when you've got an inertial frame you can deal supposed to deal with special relativity and when you've got a non-inertial frame you're supposed to be dealing with general relativity so he's making a very confused and that's uh, answer about what what frame is an inertial frame and what frame isn't. You know, obviously supporting Einstein's uh, Einstein view that the uh, clock at the equator is working slower than the other one. So he this person is supporting Einstein's view as opposed to the other. And they oppose the other person. So the first person believes in Einstein's relativity but thinks Einstein made a mistake. This person believes in Einstein's relativity and thinks Einstein is correct. So this is the confusions. The equator is working slower than the other one. Here is Maddox's answer which says that Einstein was confused. Okay. So this is the third answer. The third answer is the belief that Einstein was confused. So this is we go through his answer. It seems now to be accepted that Einstein's original argument was uncharacteristically loose, which is probably a way of saying Einstein was confused. The point of this point of the illustration is that a clock at the pole of rotation may be taken to be an inertial frame, which is nearly, uh, but not quite properly defined by the direction of the Earth's motion around the Sun. The clock at the equator is in another. Einstein's lack of clarity concerns the inertial frame of the observer of the two clocks. So this is this supposed to be a solution from the people who believe in Einstein's relativity. First solution, person who believes in Einstein's relativity and believes that Einstein made a mistake. In, in a derivation from that theory. The second solution is from a person who believes in Einstein's relativity and believes Einstein was correct in what he said uh, for that derivation. And the third person is thinking Einstein is, uh, is, is being a bit ambiguous, uncharacteristically loose. So we've got three different opinions here as to what is meant by Einstein's relativity. It is completely uh, unclear when you try to work out things from Einstein's relativity it just ends up into a mass of confusions where people believe different things so the second per part of the problem is, is trying to decide uh, what frames are inertial frame which clock is an inertial frame which clocks are not in an inertial frame and so forth you've got all this massive confusions of what's going on with any physical situation so we try to pick it up now. So, his answer carry on. which says that Einstein was confused, or was confusing, uh, and he talked. Uh, he says one clock is in a reference frame, the other clock's in a different reference frame. Whereas Whitrow's answer, the previous one, previous one said that one is in a reference frame and uh, or associated with a reference frame, and the other cannot. So there's all these three different answers. Uh, I made up an argument from the uh, statement about the polar and equatorial clock. So those are the three people who uh, believe <coughs> believed in Einstein's relativity, all coming up with different answers. So that is that ambiguity and confusion within Einstein's relativity. Even if you think uh, Einstein is correct in, his reli in, in, reli believe in Einstein's relativity, you've got all this confusion when you're actually dealing with it. And people will just contradict themselves and say different things. So I don't, I, this is what, um, what Clausen was thinking about things. I want to pick things up a bit further on. So this is uh, picking it up further on. He, he's uh, 
McClawson is talking to a Professor Good and <clears throat> Professor Good is a supporter of Einstein's relativity uh, and his opinion was about an issue what Einstein was talking about I, that Einstein made a slip so that was his opinion Einstein made a slip when taken literally immediately contradicts uh, kinematics or the special theory of relativity all of the inconsistency claimed by McClawson resided in Einstein's step none of it resided in uh, the kinematics of the special theory of relativity so his, his uh, reasoning to what McClawson was saying in 1982 uh, no, 19, 19, 1998 was that what what McClawson was complaining about was really uh, all contained within what Einstein made a slip about saying and really the theory of special relativity is still okay that was his view in 1998 and then a bit later on he changes his tune in, in 2006 uh, Good changed his view on that and he says, what I previously called Einstein's slip wasn't a slip after all. This correction doesn't imply an inconsistency in the chromatics of special theory of relativity, although it would appear to do so to those who regard time travel as logically impossible. So you've got uh, Professor Good saying one thing one moment, looking at looking what Einstein's done, saying, saying one thing, and later coming back and having changed his mind. So this is another big problem with the supporters of Einstein's relativity. They will give you a quick answer and they will give a solution to a certain physical problem and they say such such a thing and then later on they will come back, maybe this is in the case of eight years I think, eight years later we come back and have changed his mind and given a different answer. So he will still claim Professor Good as a support of Einstein's relativity, will still be claiming a belief in Einstein's relativity, he would just uh, have changed his mind about some about the issue of how to interpret a physical experiment. So this is the complete utter confusion which is happening. If I can pick it up, hopefully in the right place. The abs uh, later um, from the abstract of his last paper in the Bay in 2006, what I previously called Einstein's slip wasn't a slip after all. This, and then after some other words, he said, this correction doesn't imply an inconsistency in the special relativity, although it would appear to do so to those who regard time travel as logically impossible. So he had conceded that it was not a slip, but he did not concede that it was still a uh, contradiction. So this is, this is the way his last paper left it. It was rather unsatisfactory. But I think it is fair to say that he failed to, uh, to refute my argument. Uh, he died shortly after that at the age of 92. And, uh, the, uh, so, but one of the things that came up in my debate with him was the, the properties of an inconsistent theory. And I can just deal with this quite briefly. So the properties of an inconsistent theory, and claiming that Einstein's relativity is inconsistent, and it gets really confusing if you suddenly, did, if the main, if the mainstream, what they've done is they accepted an inconsistent theory, and it makes it very confusing then when they start saying they've tested the theory by experiment. If you tested an th inconsistent by theory by experiment, it's just nonsense, really. It's just nonsense. So you get in your, getting into a muddle, trying to talk about something like that. So I'm going to pass on that you can actually go and look at the video on that to get more details. I want to get now to the bit of the conclusion. So picking up Matt Dingle now.
a scientist. In fact, I think he deserves the highest praise for criticizing the um, the Lingo's arguments and my argument, because uh, comparing him to the relativists who hide behind all those illogical arguments and call the rest of us who dispute these uh, uh, inconsistent arguments, uh, they call us crackpots or whatever. So I think uh, I would like to pay tribute to Professor Good, who uh, was also a very distinguished British scientist. He, um, I, I wish he and Dingo, I wish he had decided to criticize Dingo's argument while Dingo was still alive, and, because that would have made a very remarkable debate if, they, if he had done so. Uh, he uh, spent the last 40 years of his life as a professor at Virginia Tech, and he was a very distinguished scientist. His distinction may be assessed by the fact that this picture is from his obituary notice in the London Times. So considering that he had spent the last 40 years of his life in the United States, I think he was, it shows he was a very highly respected person. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I am proud to have worked with both these people. So that was the conclusion. Um, basically, we can go back to the uh, paper he wrote. So, if we go back to here, uh, the mainstream is not really addressing the criticism of Einstein's relativity. They're, they're trying to dismiss it. And that's basically Professor Good, who is a supporter of Einstein's relativity was having a debate with uh, Ian McClawson about it and they sadly passed away and McClawson was concluding that he, he, he wished that Professor Good had talked to Dingle while Dingle was alive and they could have discussed the differences about uh, special relativity and so forth but what you basically got is even if you want to believe in Einstein's special theory of relativity then people are going to say different things about it and they're not going to be consistent we as dissidents think the theory is inconsistent and from the point of view of many believers in Einstein's relativity they will think they will think themselves uh, say so you ask Professor A what 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 do you think from special relativity? They will give you such such thing. You will ask Professor B, and he will say something completely different. And you say, well, well, that looks like that looks like special relativity is inconsistent. And you point it out to Professor A that he's saying different to what Professor B is saying. And Professor A will say, well, Professor B's got it wrong. And you will ask Professor B, and Professor B will say, well, Professor A's got it wrong. And so that's what you're up against. You're up, a pe up against people who think they believe Einstein's relativity and they will say different things in contradiction to what other people are saying and they will believe themselves right and the other person wrong. And that's the complete mess what you're in with, special rel with Einstein's relativity. When, when I've looked at Einstein's relativity, it, from going from what Einstein's saying, Einstein is just a confusing mess. And I've got my videos. I should have put my videos up. Oh, videos. So I've gone through the videos. So we've got this person. Uh, next. My videos are getting big now. Big list of them. So we've got this person here. Who, he's, he's, worked, he's worked out Edward Teller didn't understand a lecture by Einstein and he finds out that Einstein didn't understand what he was talking about so this is what is supposed to be a theory which the mainstream's got they got a theory which the person who put it forward didn't know what he was talking about and then then uh, putting aside the issue that actually it's all based upon a lie it's all based upon a lie and um, if you put aside the issue it's based on the lie you've got a theory and you're trying to work out something to make it make make sense 
it doesn't. People were saying different things, and then it's uh, get to the maths of it. Einstein was incompetent uh, with maths, and when you look into the maths that he was using, it's just nonsense. So <laughs> nonsense all the way through. It starts off as nonsense, and then then I have a professor of Ottervaiden if. He goes when the maths gets really complicated with general relativity. If I got the link, okay, yeah, that one. When you when you get into the complicated maths of general relativity, it's still nonsense. So you start off with maths, which is nonsense when it's when it's not too complicated. And then you just build on it, and you make more and more complicated maths. And when you when you actually look at that maths, it's it's still nonsense when it's still complicated. So it's it's just just a mountain of nonsense, really. It's just awful. It is awful what they have done to uh, um, physics. It's just just what 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 uh, uh, Dr. Brian Wallace Brian Wallace explains. It's a farce. It's just a farce what they've done. Einstein being wrong. So he looked at it. Site I will be dealing with is. The so this is the book by Dr. Brian Wallace, Farce of Physics. Einstein turned physics into a farce. It's just a farce. You got people who who just want to believe nonsense. You've got a terrible mess, and they're trying to keep it as a mess. As pointed out now, in this, in here, by the paper by Ian, Cla Ian McClawson, concludes at the end they're trying to keep, they're trying to keep criticism of uh, Einstein's relativity out of the mainstream science journals. Con Scientists continue to ignore the self-evident contradictions in the arguments that were used by uh, the critics of uh, Herbert Dingle uh, to answer his criticisms. And editors of mainstream journals refuse even to consider papers critical of Einstein's work. So they they just don't want to don't want to go into the criticism of Einstein. They don't want it anymore. They have blocked it. It's it's a, a prejudiced point of view. They want a which means they want to keep it as a mess. They want physics to stay in a mess. Einstein turned physics into a mess and now suddenly it's turned into a religion where they've got the dogma of believing in Einstein and they want to keep it as a mess. So that's what where we're at. And if you've got these people like you've got people like Max Planck who think who used to think Think, think that the opponents will eventually die and go away. No, they're not. We're still here. Even if you're ignoring us, we're still here. We're still dissenting against Einstein. We're still opposing Einstein. And if you're still saying Einstein does not make any sense, we are still opposing it. We, we may die, but we're gonna, we're gonna just carry on this. There'll be a new generation and a new generation and so forth. And this issue, which you want to ignore. Uh, we will just keep be there. Thank you.